Uh, hello everyone, I'm very happy to meet you to all today, even though that I have met uh, some of you already doing games. I am, uh, Sandrine presented me as a human geography. I would uh, describe myself as an environmentalist, moreover, than a human geographer. And I am also the director of the Center for Earth Politics. This is something, a center, that we have created in between the Université Paris Cité and uh, Institute of Global Physics and Sciences Po in Paris. And we uh, an assembly, a group of diverse researchers uh, from different disciplines. Some are ge geochemists, some are anthropologists, some are physicists, some are climatologists. So we have given ourselves this interdisciplinary mission to work on Anthropocene issues. So what I am going to present very briefly, because I have only 25 minutes and more than 50 slides, so I will skip some of them, I'm very sorry. Uh, the work that we have been doing, the center was created in two, uh, 2019, so it's quite recent, not more than five years. And we have been working all these years on this issue, uh, the issue of habitability. That's something that I've been working uh, earlier on, on a previous program that, we have, uh, that I coordinated with Sabine Barl, who is right now in this room, I talked already of habitability. So the overview of this talk is divided in five chapters, the introduction. I will try to define what I, what I, what we mean by habitability. Once again, this is a product of a collective work, and I usually work collectively, so it's... Uh, then I will uh, talk about planetary boundaries, uh, and I try to tell you why I do talk about planetary boundaries. Uh, it's something that uh, is important in the field of habitability, I think. Then I will present how do we live or should we live in, within planetary boundaries, and why, while we will live in uh, planetary boundaries, still it is a very inegalitarian civilization we, we, we placed in. And what does it mean to conclude? So the context of this talk, I mean, I won't repeat what you all know about the uh, urgency of, uh, of habitability, because we have so many disasters, I don't have to, to go on that. Uh, and this is also the expected consequences of insufficient action. I think that every time I talk in front of whatever audience, most of, uh, I mean, whatever audience, not only researchers, but also people coming from all, uh, bit, uh, all parts of society, we all convince uh, that we don't do enough regarding this urgency. And so what we define as the Earth habitability is a result of collective choices. It's not only planetary boundaries, that's why I will come back on that afterwards. That is socio-economic and political strategies for mitigation adaptation aimed at respecting planetary boundaries and cycles augmented by collective mobilization at different scales once again, we talk of different scales, not only the global scale, and acting in the name of different sets of values, because we are from different parts of the world with different history, and among them, social justice is a very important value uh, that I valorize. For me and my colleagues, habitability is therefore a dialogical process. It's not a given. Uh, and we take into account uh, studying habitability at different scales, so multiple human, natural, and technical inter uh, intermediaries that regulate exchanges caught between constraint. And constraints is, for me, planetary boundaries. It is a way to define the constraining world, but also the power to be collectively and what I call, uh, what is called by other researchers and I, uh, potential. 
So this dialogical process is something very important for me, ther theoretically speaking. This uh, work on habitability, uh, you can find it uh, on the site of the Center for Earth Politics. Uh, we, it is a positioning paper. It's both in French and in English. Uh, uh, we studied also uh, how it relates, this notion of habitability, both to natural sciences and to human sciences. I won't go in depth because it would take too much time, uh, but it has not at all the same meaning in both natural sciences and human sciences. It's not only a question of scales. What was uh, defined as habitability in the natural sciences was uh, to study extraterrestrial uh, habitability of different planets. Uh, there, but in human sciences, we just studied how human beings were living on this planet. So it's a very different approach uh, through time. So as I told you briefly, uh, the planetary boundaries is for me the framework to define constraint. This is the first fo foot of habitability. And as I will go briefly into what is called planetary boundaries, uh, you may be aware of this framework already because it has been widely publicized. Just uh, a word of caution regarding planetary boundaries because it has been uh, widely criticized uh, that it concerns mainly the global north. I mean, it is a framework that defines constraints and that aim to define policies, uh, but that uh, was born in the global north. And even though now uh, Rockstrom and other people have tried to widen their field of investigation, it still is a framework that was defined for and, and by the global north. So this is the main critique. And when I talk of planetary boundaries, uh, will, you will keep in mind that using a framework of reference is not to be critical towards it. I mean, you can use something and be critical and be uh, really aware of its limits. First of all, uh, the planetary boundaries come from somewhere. I mean, it has a long story, and a part of this story is this, the limits to growth, uh, this is a report that was uh, written by Donella Mid Meadows and her husband, that's how I say it now, uh, in 72. And what they did uh, and succeeded uh, is to modelize uh, and develop a systemic vision of the socio-ecosystem. And that was quite new at the time, there were other uh, work going in the same direction, but they had a, different, uh, a limited set of, uh, of data, and they tried to see how the loops and negative feedback and all kind of loops were going in different direction, and so they could see how the components of growth were exponential through time. So that's something that had a huge posterity, and there were recent work showing that they were quite in the right in their uh, prevision. So the planetary boundaries is something of a different nature, uh, because we're not talking anymore of the finiteness of the resources uh, on this Earth we talk about the limited capacity of certain biophysical regulation mechanism uh, that sustain the state of the planet. So it's not just how we're going to extract resources, even and just to modelize how it goes with the, the rise of the population or other factors. We're just trying to see how certain biophysical regulation mechanisms do work given the state, uh, given the actual state and where we're pushing them. So this is the revised 
uh, schema of uh, the planetary boundaries. It was first defined in 2009 uh, by a group, uh, a big group, I, I don't know how many there were, but I think around 15 or more researchers defined these planetary boundaries. And they were redefined uh, in a paper that was published uh, by Stefan uh, in 2015, uh, including the critiques, and they were very numerous, uh, given to this uh, schema of the start. So I'm not going to state out the nine uh, planetary boundaries. You can see them here displayed, uh, above all because I don't have time and I am I really want to reach the end of my uh, 50 slides. <laughs> so uh, this is another representation. Uh, I sometimes I put two images of the same thing for a certain reason because I think that the images do play a role in the way we have to conceive things as themselves. And I think that the success of planetary boundaries was very much due to the way to represent that. In French, we have a game, we call it the Le Jeu des Mille Bornes. Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to say something about it, but the fact that the planetary boundary is, is represented by a wheel of a, a vehicle like that, it plays a role with, uh, with the facility we have with it. So this is a French representation of the planetary boundaries that was published this year in 2023, uh, we'll discuss it later on. This is another representation of uh, how uh, we, in 2009, had only three boundaries crossed, then in 2015, four, then in uh, 2023, six of them. I think for many environmentalists, you're aware of that, that the sixth one was uh, crossed this summer. So it's not a new, a new topic, it's about fresh water. Um, and this is also a representation that was a way to answer to critiques because uh, some of these critiques were, uh, were concerned the fact that we have different, uh, different parts, you know, climate change, biodiversity, then, and these parts don't interact. So we know nothing, we know how much a certain level of erosion of biodiversity is rich, but we don't know how it interacts with climate change, for example. So, and this schema was supposed to give us some insight about that. So this is a way to calculate this, uh, planet, uh, the, va uh, the control variables and the planetary boundaries. Once again, I uh, won't go in depth, but this also has, uh, has received a lot of critics. So if you're interested in the planetary boundaries, you should read critics also. I will give some reference. Uh, so in order for you to have a critical mind regarding this schema, uh, not uh, without forgetting that it had a huge influence. Uh, this schema, uh, the planetary boundaries, had a huge influence and still has. Uh, this is in uh, 2019, the French uh, did, and they're not the only one, the European Commission did some work about it, the Netherlands did some work about it, and other countries did too. Uh, and they tried, the French, to see, uh, to see how it concerned France. I mean, and you have to keep in mind, and that's part of the difficulty of the planetary boundaries, that it was not supposed to be localized. It was not supposed to be territorial, something like that, geographized. And so this thing and other things, this is the more recent schema uh, of the 2023 French report about the territorialization of planetary boundaries, and they give some words about how they did it and what kind of calculus is behind the territorialization of uh, planetary boundaries. And one of the principles they use is what they call the principle of egalitarian. This is another very difficult English word, 
egalitarianism, uh, meaning they give uh, the, the same amount of something uh, outside a, a global uh, quantity. So you, I mean, that's something, once again, there are, you can find this online. Uh, you can upload it and look in details because uh, the devil is in details, as every, everyone knows. And it's very important to be quite critical regarding this kind of representation. So what are the main critics? I try to, to, to play both parts. On the one hand, a critic. On the other hand, why it was useful still to have these planetary boundaries. The first critique is uh, the fact that the health system sciences are quite in their infancy. So, and there are many unpredictable points at which ecological balances break down. And also there was, and there still is, a problem of subscales and aggregations uh, mechanism, which is really not very clear. And the, this is the cons and the pro uh, is the fact that the planetary boundaries were felt as being a strong integrating uh, impact on the global change research community and brought together diverse scientists who were working separately. Uh, for example, uh, climate, biodiversity issues. So this uh, planetary boundaries uh, diagram has this impact. A second critique is too big a role given to science and not enough to politics, and that it was an expert-driven technocratic attempt uh, at a global expertocracy. But on the other side, this is the critique, and, but on the other side, some scholars and civil society organizations thought that it was a good framework to push uh, some agenda and uh, going uh, in uh, 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 trying to push for a specific governance of this problem. So they used it. I mean, on one hand, you critique, but on the other hand, you find many groups who are using it. One critique is also about the fantasy of a rational top-down government of the planet Earth, what we call the cockpitism. You know, you on, on your plane or in your car, uh, widely above like Musk. Uh, in your satellite, and you think you can govern Earth like that. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it responded to the increasing uh, fragmentation of the Earth system governance. And so it had some pro and cons. The last critique I'm going, I mean, you can find many details, and uh, uh, let me, I'll, I'll find you the reference and many reference we can have about these critiques. Uh, it's by focusing on top-down control, we are obscuring the real problem. That is about uh, domination issues, power issues, uh, and the fact that we fight in uh, entrenched industrial interest. Uh, but on the other side of the, of the, of the, of the coin, uh, it did bring some, um, it, was, it was quite uh, uh, fertile in terms of bringing the degrowth uh, issue on the table. So it's, on one side, it is very much, you know, green economics as usual. On the other side, it was quite interesting because it brought to light some uh, degrowth issues that were necessary. So. And another thing is also the debate around anthropocentrism versus ecocentrism, because this is what the southern country were saying, that uh, it was uh, uh, too much of an ecocentric debate, and they really uh, are more attached to the, uh, the sustainable development, uh, uh, how, how is it called, uh, les ODG. Uh, Gold, yeah, thank you. So Rockstrom has heard some of it 
In the recent paper that was published this summer in Nature, he has tried to, to, to go more in depth in the social science issues, in the justice issues, and he has tried to address this with people, researchers coming from the South. It's still, if you read this paper, and it's worth it, I think it's still a weak attempt. And he has created also with other researchers the Earth Commission. I think it's uh, located in Potsdam uh, University. And it tries to, you know, bring more light to these planetary boundaries with other researchers coming from other disciplines, especially social and human sciences. So these are for constraints. I, I'll go very quickly on that because it's like just details. Uh, OK. Uh, let me. So now the second part of my talk is about how do we live in, within planetary boundaries. Uh, some economists responded to this uh, work of Rockstrom. You know, or you may know, this uh, donut uh, image, still a representation of the same thing. This is a wheel, but the wheel has two sides, and it's called a donut, so something to eat, which is quite different in terms of in symbolic terms. So I will go very quickly. <laughs> And uh, so she tried to gather information and show, for example, this is France, this is Ghana, how much we could, on one side, uh, uh, overpass planetary boundaries, which is the case of France, and respond to social needs. On the other side, not uh, trespass planetary boundaries, uh, but not respond to uh, plan uh, social needs. And this is. Another schema, uh, which I find more interesting, a good life within planetary boundaries. Uh, and this good life within planetary boundaries was written by Danielle O'Neill, and there was uh, Julia Stenberger, who is, uh, who, who is one of the authors. And you can see all countries. This is planetary boundaries, and these are social thresholds. And you can see the US is here, the France is here, and Vietnam is here, but if you would, if you would like to stay within uh, the donut area, you would be here, which is not the case of any country. So, okay, so I don't m have much time, I'm very sorry. Uh, I think uh, uh, when we discuss of that, uh, of planetary boundaries, to live within planetary boundaries, we never should forget how unequal we are. I mean, an inequality for me is at the start, and I'm quoting a famous writer, French writer, political writer. He was one of the founders of political ecology in France, uh, André Gorse. He wrote this book, which is called Ecology et Politique, in 78. Uh, and he said, globally, he said that well, scarcity is constantly recreated to maintain inequality in hierarchy. And this is part of capitalism. It is why we should step out of capitalism if we want to answer to the problems that we confront nowadays. And that is why I think, uh, and I'll finish with that, I guess, yes, <laughs> uh, because I have uh, 20 slides left, but that's OK. Uh, that <laughs> that right now, what we see in the majority of countries that we have a huge uh, income and wealth inequalities growing. Uh, you can uh, relate to the wor work that was done by Piketty with, with the World uh, Database for Inequalities, for example. Uh, and these inequalities have been uh, entrenched and even rushed uh, by the climate change. So now we can estimate how much inequality are more are stronger because of climate change and the impact of climate change on inequalities. Furthermore, the richest one person just consume and emit more carbon, I mean, uh, 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 more than twice as much carbon as the poorest half of the population. 
But if you work on inequalities, you shouldn't work only on uh, income. You should also work on geographical inequalities, access meaning, access to heating, access to residential location, resi uh, 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 job location, uh, because there is a very strong structure, structuring aspect in the uh, uh, fra uh, in fragmentation and inequ uh, the geography of inequalities. And last but not least, while the poorest people do contribute less to carbon emission, they are also the most vulnerable to, uh, to carbon, uh, to the impact of climate change. I will show just this map to finish. This is thermal inequity. Uh, that is seen as a distributive justice risk. Uh, this is in the Routledge Handbook of Climate Justice that was published uh, at Routledge in, uh, I don't know which year, 2018. And, uh, well, you, you can't see very well on this, uh, on this. but that, that has a strong dimension of inequality in terms of distribution. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I've been uh, a bit rushed.